Hello, everybody. Join us today, Simple Biz 360, with our guest, Ryan Dement, out of Arizona. Stick around. This is going to be a good one. Hello, everybody. Jeff Mason, your host of Simple Biz 360 podcast. With us today is a special guest, Ryan Dement out of Arizona. Ryan, please tell us a little bit about yourself, if you could. Well, thank you, sir, for first having me on. Uh, Ryan Dement, as you said, I am a guy out there that's just trying to change the world one house at a time. My day job is affordable housing development. My uh, passions are to podcasts. And anywhere, anywhere in between, I have a nonprofit that does financial coaching, and uh, I've got a great family and some dogs that I enjoy thoroughly. All right. Sounds great. Well, thanks so much for being on. Now, what part of Arizona are you coming from today? Just outside of Phoenix. It's called Litchfield Park. It's just west, about 25 minutes. Okay, great. Well, thanks for being on, folks. Uh, we are on YouTube. Uh, you can catch us there, and uh, we are also on 28 listening platforms. So, you know, everything you can think of, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, Apple, you know, you name it, we're on it. So, uh, at any rate, we're going to have some fun today, and uh, we are going to start off by doing something different. Now, Ryan and I are both... I would say seasoned podcasters. Ryan, how many, between the two different podcasts you have, and please shout out the names and where they can find them, but how many podcasts do you have under your belt so far? Chasing Financial Freedom is uh, 210 episodes. Chasing Happiness is just crossed 40 episodes. Okay. So you got about 250 in the bank. I've got about 160 in the bank. So we both, you know, been at the mic and done this a little bit. We both in, been in corporate leadership. We both been down that path. So we're going to do something different today. We're going to let Ryan create the title for this show, and then we're going to lean in to questioning to, to kind of fit that title, if you will. And, and please know this, listeners, it's, it's all designed to leave you with some encouragement, leave you with some takeaways that hopefully can help you in your life as well. So what would you name today's show, Ryan? Off the cuff, I'd have to say change and failure is part of success. Okay. They're not, they're, they are intertwined, but they're not at a fork. They're, they're all part of the process. And if you're not changing and failing, you're not improving and succeeding in life. You're kind of sitting on the couch and you're not a climber in life. Okay. Okay, great. So changing and yeah, so, so let's dip back to, you know, I mean, go back to failure, if you will, and just kind of highlight, you know, when's the first time in your life you've ever experienced any type of failure? Was it athletics, scholastically or oh, testing or what, when was it? That, that'd be young age. I mean, that's in my, uh, I was playing baseball five, six years old. Okay. And failing then. So I'm not a spring chicken. I'm, I'm approaching 50 years old. And, and, you know, back then we, uh, we failed and, you know, mom and dad kind of gave you that hoorah and you didn't always get a trophy and it's kind of a little different today. I get it, but, um, failure was always part of the path. And the only way I know how to define failure is going through the lens of trying something new and being uncomfortable. I know, um, when I was in corporate America, the biggest thing that scared me was getting up in front of people and talking and you'd be amazed. You'd think I'd be like, it'd be no, no big deal. But I got so afraid I'd break out in a sweat. Uh, I couldn't speak. I, I mean, there was just so many things. And then finally I had a boss one day to say, Hey, you need to put something in your hand and it keeps you going. And I was like, are you kidding me? He put a little tiny rock in my hand and it didn't happen overnight. Don't get me wrong practice having conversations and being in front of people and being comfortable with who I was and who I am today, that allows you to grow. And that's part of the change and the failure because man, I failed many times when I was up front yeah. talking to people, trying to motivate the troops when you got thousands of people uh, that you're speaking to. It's tough. And yeah. I, I struggled with that for many years. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I really appreciate you uh, letting us know that. Now, Ryan comes from a background, and just to give you an idea, when he's talking about getting up and speaking in front of people, worked in uh, 25 years in corporate America, Fortune 25 company, in fact, uh, companies. And, you know, you're managing uh, or leading, what, over 2,000 people at, at some of these given points? Is that correct? Correct. Mostly call centers. So any financial instrument, I pretty, touched, I pretty much touched it. Uh, car notes, student loans, mortgages, 
collections, uh, servicing, underwriting, back office functions, all of those things, even the outsourcing piece. I I ran a huge outsourcing uh, agency for uh, the Department of Ed back in the day and have to fly to the Philippines to manage it over there. So that was even more difficult is wow. you have people halfway around the world that you're managing. Yeah. So here, here you are, you know, you know, managing all these people and now you got to get up in front of people and you, you know, you feel like you're going to fail and you're, you know, it's intimidating. Uh, it's yeah, it's, it's, you know, yeah, it's nerve wracking. I, I, I failed. I failed many times and it, it, and I was embarrassed too. I mean, uh, it, it was hard to do, but it was just, I think I got to the point where I got tired of failing and I said, something has to change. And I was lucky to have the bot, my boss come in and explain that to me, uh, and work with me over time. But I think for me, and it might be different for other people, once I get sick and tired of something, I know that there's time for change and there's time for reflection um, to move forward or do something different. And I think that's kind of how we all are, are looking at things is, you know, we're time, it's time for change, sick and tired, move forward. Yeah. But if you don't ever get there, yeah. no one can do the work for you. You have to do the work yeah. for yourself. You got to get there. And, and if you don't get there you're going to stay in the same spot in life and, and not, not achieve that life that you're looking for. Yeah. So let's take a look at change in a couple of minutes. So let's, let's just go back. You know, I love the, I love the uh, illustration of, of youthfulness and, mm -hmm. you know, we're in some elementary things like sports or like neighborhood dodgeball games or whatever. And when we feel like, um, you know, we've let our friends down or let our team down, or we've made mistakes that have caused something to happen. You know, at that young age, we really, I remember that you really feel like, you know, the impact of that failure is very great. And if we have parents or friends that tease us about us or, you know, ride us about it and make us feel bad, then I can see how later on in life we can carry some of that as baggage and not luggage, if you will. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you, uh, if you're able to see that failure as a curveball that just, you know, threw you down to the dirt and you've got to learn how to brush off and get back up and, hey, maybe I'll play dodgeball better tomorrow or maybe I won't <laughs> miss that fly ball tomorrow, but I've got to brush myself off and get back up. And, you know, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you can't you can't go to change eventually if you haven't learned that that getting brushed back and you're on the dirt, that process of brushing the dirt off and getting back up and getting back into the game and going after another swing, that's the important thing, right? And how many, I mean, you coach a lot of people. How many people miss that element? Uh, majority of people that come to us through our nonprofit they are struggling financially, do not have the financial tools they've been left behind. And seven out of 10 want us to do the work. They want us to fix their financial problems. They want us to get them out of debt. They want us to work with the collection agencies or the attorneys or the wage garnishments that they're going through. And it doesn't work that way. And we have a saying above our door. It says, we'll be here when you're ready. Yeah. That's yeah. the engagement piece that we put out there. And that in the... The ironic thing in that is we lead all the way up to the person having that first consult with a um, a coach, a financial coach, and they do not take the steps that they need to do to get there. And that's disheartening. And for me, it, when we first started, because I was doing most of the coaching, now we have coaches on through grants, um, was tough. I went down rabbit holes with them. There's another change that I had to work with was I was trying to save everybody that came through the door. Doesn't work that way. Yeah. You've got to find the people that are hungry and ready for that change in their life. Otherwise, they're just going to take you down, unfortunately, that same rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. No, very, very well put. Yeah, you have to have that humility that's saying, hey, I want, and, and you know, I'm in the I'm in the self-development, um, much like you are, I'm in the self-development mm -hmm. professional arena where we look at the experience economy and we try to figure out how to harness continuous improvement. Well, you can't do that if you don't even have a thirst for it to begin with. If there's no appetite for it up front, you know, you, there's nothing driving you to get there. So, you know, I, I look back on failure and I think for anybody listening, in my opinion, you know, every time you fail, it's an opportunity to learn what you did wrong and try, you said change, you know, try to change the way you approach it next time to avoid making that same mistake. But, but the lessons that are baked into those um, failures, they're learning experience, they're lessons learned. 
you know, I worked for a, I worked for a guy who was in the Navy and he worked on a sub. And I'll never forget. He told us he had a blackboard up there on the sub mm-hmm. and they always said, anytime we make a mistake, write it on the blackboard. It's a lesson learned. And we're going to keep it there as a focal point because we don't want to do it again. And so it was a failure in essence, right? Cause it was a lesson mm-hmm. they learned from failure, but they've, they'll avoid it next time. So for people who are apprehensive about engaging in something because they're going to fail. I mean, not to give out free advice, but what's your advice as a coach to say, it's okay to embrace this. Why, why is it okay to embrace this? It's life. We all are going to fail in life. So you might as well just take it on and actually work with it. I, whether it's free advice or not, I, I like to share this with somebody or everybody, or even if it touches one person is this, if you want to gain something in life, you're going to have to take that step forward. You're going to have to work towards that goal. Yeah. But while you're working on that goal, you've got to be thankful for the things that you have today. Yeah. Roof over your head, food on the table, clothes on your back. You're warm, cool, whatever you want to be. But until you have all those things come together and you're willing to put yourself in that very uncomfortable position of change, it doesn't go anywhere. And life just stays where it's at. And most people, unfortunately, and I say that unfortunately because I hear it day in and day out, they just don't have, and it's it's not fortitude, but they just don't have that hunger yet to change. They haven't hit that rock bottom place. Unfortunately, that's that's a lot of people struggling today. Debt is up. We're we're spending on credit cards. Uh, inflation's out there. We you know we've got all those things going on, and we've been kind of caged up because of things that have happened and so forth. And we're, we're trying to change the way we're doing things and get out and about travel, see families, but we've also got to change ourselves and, and work through that process. And it's, it's, it's a lot of work. And if you, the best way I know to describe this is this, if you're not there, you haven't hit rock bottom or you, you're not hungry enough for that change. Your life isn't going to go anywhere. And I think that ties in, I could go on down a whole nother rabbit hole with social media I mean, I I have people reach out through the podcast that say, hey, I want to be like you. And I'm like, you want to be like me in eight year overnight success. And I don't even call myself that Uh, two failed businesses, you know, four and a half years of podcasting of now just getting the podcast to where I thought they were going to be in the first year. It's a struggle and it boils down to being consistent, persistent, and then also getting up when you fail. Yeah, yeah, that's what life is about. Absolutely. So uh, thank you so much for that. So now we're at this change, uh, you know, juncture, you know, to kind of to kind of uh, ride shotgun with, you know, uh, failure. So change, you know, we've heard this, we've heard this bantered around, at least I have growing up, that the only constant in life, you know, Jeff, you know, the only constant in life is change. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking, you know, change is like, honestly, it's so constant. It's like putting the keys in the car to start the car. I mean, Mm -hmm. go anywhere, we've got to put the keys in. To go anywhere in life, you've got to embrace the fact that today I may be confronted with, you know, one opportunity or, you know, 10 opportunities to change. What am I going to do when I'm confronted with that? And and that's really to your point, you know, you've got to have this, you've got to have this desire to want to embrace that part of life before you can, you know, you, so you have to move forward. You have to accept change is going to come. So how do you, how do you coach a person who, um, just is afraid of making that step out into the world to see, you know, what it's, what it's all about in essence. I mean, what, when they're independent, you know, what's it like to be, try to be independent out there? How do you coach a person like that? I don't think it's coaching. It's more, it boils down to is like I said earlier, they're ready to make that change. So the gentleman that um, I spoke to earlier and I referred to earlier, he is not hit rock bottom because mom and dad haven't really cut him off completely because he still has a roof over his head. He's getting food on the table and he's warm. So until he actually gets that change in his life where he potentially would be thrown out, I don't think he's ready to go after that. He he, uh, if I remember right, he finished two years of college. He has a passion for education. He wants to be something with history. I can't remember it was something off topic that I've never heard of. And I'm like, okay, cool. Does that make you happy? Yes, it does. So then go back to school. If that's what you want to do and you need a degree to go get that job, 
go do it. But the, the first question I asked him is, do you have to have a degree? Yeah. And he goes, I'm not sure. I'll write that down on your list. Yeah. That you have to do. But I mean, the change piece, it has to come from inside. Yep. It really boils down to that. Yeah. Well, so so you, you comfort some folks out there. And let's talk about it because I've, I've I've failed at two businesses before I create a successful business. And you just mentioned you did. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know what? I mean, take us through the process of how you dealt with it, and then I'll, I'll share my process. How did you deal with getting back up after a failed business? I mean, how bad was it? I, I, I mean, did it, <laughs> did it wipe you out I, financially? I, or I what? laugh. I, I laugh because it was pretty bad. I was uh, six figures in debt. Uh, I couldn't file bankruptcy because I needed to go back to corporate America and corporate America wouldn't allow me to have a bankruptcy on my record because I was managing financial instruments at the time and it wouldn't play. So guess what? I had to find a way to pay the debt off. And so going back to corporate America with my tail, my, you know, between my legs, uh, I had to suck it up. Luckily my boss was still there. He brought me back. Um, and I was able to start working through that process, but it probably took me I would probably say between six to nine months before I really got out of a funk. I was in, I was, uh, I don't know if I was depressed. It was more like I was ashamed okay. that I failed for the second time. And I felt so bad. I let everybody down. Um, I, I just, I just was in that funk and it, and it was translating into my work at, at corporate America. And it translated in my personal life because I sat around, did nothing after I worked 80 hours a week. Uh, and sat around and watched TV and ate popcorn or food or whatever you want to talk about and gained weight and was not healthy. So it finally took me being sick and tired of that to say, okay, I'm going to get my head back in the game. And the first thing I need to do is change my diet, get myself healthy again. I mean, the company offered us free gym and, and free membership and free food. I mean, healthy food, decent at the time, uh, and was able to get on that track. And then th- during that time, I was able to put together a financial plan to where I put a schedule together for paying off my debt. And while I started seeing, you know, wins with paying off my debt, I said, there's got to be something else I can do something else I'm passionate about. Because what got me in trouble the first two times was greed. Yeah. It was all about the money. It wasn't about the why it wasn't about the passion. It was about money. Okay. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do that I'm passionate about? And that's where um, the idea of defaulted mortgages came in. I was, t- I was um, turned on to it through a friend of a friend. And they said, oh, you need to go check that out. And I'm like, wait a minute, I can go buy a mortgage and become a a bank and do all that great stuff that banks do and not have to worry about uh, the process of foreclosing and so forth. And like, well, it's not like that. It's there's a little more complicated, you know, complications to it. And I said, "Okay, I'll start looking at it. But that took about another six to 12 months before I really got knee deep into that and really started driving that home to figure out, could I make it a, a viable side hustle initially? And then could I actually start producing some income out of it? Yeah. Interesting. So, so you were at this juncture of failure that forced you, basically, you knew, Hey, I got to change what I'm doing. I have to, you know, diet was one of them, other things, but you know, putting a plan together. And I think that's the critical thing is that, you know, failure a- allows you to hit a T in the road pretty much. And you've mm-hmm. really got to realize, Hey, I can't, you know, there's nowhere to go forward here. I got to go right or left. So what am I going to do? I, I have to embrace the fact that things have to change. And I remember, you know, I call it reboot. I remember early in sales, I was, um, I wasn't doing what I was trained to do. I was failing. I was about two hundred dollars away from a from a draw versus commission uh, scenario mm-hmm. from being fired. And I heard a gentleman speak one night at a, at a weekly sales meeting. And I went home that night and said, "I'm going to have to come in tomorrow and change the way I'm doing things. So I'm going to reboot what I'm doing." And once I rebooted what I did and followed the corporate you know, train that I received, everything changed. So it was an amazing, you know, exercise of seeing change affect me positively firsthand. And I also, you know, I tried to, to put together a company with my dad. We were at it for two and a half years. He ran out of money. So I had to fork over the company to him. I said, you're, you know, you're older than I am. I'm young. I'm 34. I can go figure out something else. Okay. Here's <laughs> everything here. But here I was. And I tell the story, no kidding, no lie. I, I sold my car, I sold, uh, we bought a junker, you know, I sold everything I had, every stock I had, I sold my precious baseball card collection, which was worth a ton of money. Wow. I mean, my Nolan Ryan card alone was $500, rookie card. I mean, so this was wow. nice. And I, I found myself finding a customer for my 1967 Pittsburgh Pirates 
you know, yearbook and cards and other paraphernalia. So I drove out to Berwyn, Pennsylvania, Paoli, King of Prussia area there, and went up there and it was an apartment, sold them the last bit of cards I had for a hundred bucks, 34 years old, two kids, go back in the parking lot, sit in my car, and I just wept. I had I penniless, you know, I had to start over. And, you know, you know, so it, 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 we, we can, and I learned so much from that experience. I really did. I learned what not to do. And what did we do wrong primarily? We started a company that was the formula for success was based on a $79 widget. And in the New York metro area, unfortunately, it was so competitive, the going price was 45. Oh, wow. So all our financial projections were off by that much money. So it, you know, it, it was just, you know, we had to just make up so much ground. And so, so at any rate, you know, I, I learned, hey, you've got to financially, you know, you got to do your fiduciary homework before you get into something, you know, and, and that's the, the main lesson out of that. But Nonetheless, you know, uh, at least now I know what not to do. So I think that's the blessing <laughs> in the failure part of it, um, for sure. Um, but, you know, so you come out of these two failures, you come out of your corporate um, experience. It seems like to me, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like to me you, you developed this servant's heart through leadership. Is that correct? Is that is that how you it it is, yourself? but I also found my passion okay. in being able to help others obtain home ownership, and that was the driver. Uh, the the notes and buying the defaulted mortgages, it, it's a somewhat of a passion. It's a driver, but my passion is developing affordable workforce housing. And now we've gone into a space to where now we have cities asking, um, can you develop veteran-only communities? I'm like, oh, sign me up. Let me figure out how to do it. So we're at one of those inflection points again to where I'm going to, and I don't think we've talked about this, but I joke about it. When I had, you know, first started out, I was eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I'm at that point again. I, I want to keep all the money in the business, not take out as much, you know, as little okay. as I can, you know, for myself to make sure my necessities are taken care of for me and my family. And that's it. I, I'll eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Everybody else can still eat, you know, their healthy food and, and the good food. But that's where my mindset comes from. And it's not a scarcity. It's more of I can survive on very little now that I understand what it takes to be a, a successful entrepreneurship or an entrepreneur, but also effectively manage the entrepreneurship. And when I say that, it's it's a ship because I've got to keep it going in the direction. Otherwise, it sinks and there's no one else to blame but myself. Okay. And so what's the name of this company now? This is the uh, real estate. True, TrueVest is uh, my name of my real estate company. Okay. And TrueVest, wh wh where can folks find that on the uh, World Wide Web? TrueVest.co, so co. Okay. So true, TrueVest.co. So um, yep. could you put that into layman's terms? So in case there's a listener out there, you know, who is involved in city management or, you know, redevelopment or anything like that, what exactly... When you, when you use some of this terminology and jargon, what exactly, can you break it down in simpler forms? What, what are you doing for communities? We go into communities, neighborhoods that have been uh, left behind from private capital and redevelop uh, city blocks, neighborhoods. So I'll give you an example. Today, we're in Evansville, Indiana, uh, Southern Indiana. We're on a block called Bayard Park, and we're developing 14 brand new houses on a block that has been pretty much desolated for 20 years. Okay. So we're knocking down some of these old row houses or shotgun houses, as you would call them. They were built in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and we're going to put brand new three-bedroom, two-bath homes, roughly 1,350 square feet under roof. And uh, we've got people lined up to buy them already. I mean, it's it's a wonderful thing to be able to change the neighborhood because the majority of people that live in that neighborhood around that block are all renters. 75% of the households within a three mile, three mile radius are renters. So now we're changing the actual atmosphere. We're giving people the tools. We're also teaching them financial literacy because they have to go through a financial literacy course to go through this program because we're partnered with the city of Evansville on this deal. Um, so they require some certain things. But these individuals have been lifelong, one family's three generations renters in a house. They've actually paid that landlord's mortgage off many times over. Okay. Yeah. And now they get to actually own their own home. 
Now, are you are you have mortgage packages through this as well? Is that also part well, of it? We have we have a lender that we work with, and we also uh, on the other side on the mortgage piece, we're a private lender too. So if we can't get somebody qualified, either ourselves or we have a group that's behind us that will actually lend privately to them, uh, and then we'll work them through that process so they can actually get refinanced out and put them into a mainstream mortgage. Okay. So uh, how did you get involved in, in, I mean, is this all urban too? Is that, I'm gleaning that it's more urban than it would be. Yeah. It is urban. So yes. how did you, uh, what, what sparked your interest in doing this? Uh, a friend of the friend, a friend of the family came along and said, Hey, I've got 35, 36 rental properties in Indiana and uh, I'm looking to get out of the business. They were all, they, most of them were occupied, but uh, every single one of them were were just horrible. I mean, I wouldn't even put my worst enemy in them. And he was a slumlord. So we just said, okay, we'll take a look at it. And then next thing you know, we've got people wanting to buy them. And there's a terminology called buying on contract. I don't know if you're familiar with that, mm -hmm. to where you have, let's say, I come to you. And I want to buy a property that you own. And you're like, uh, and I tell you, sorry, I don't have good credit. Can you carry the contract? It's basically a, a four or five page document that says, okay, I'm going to pay you $500 a month, let's say, for the next 15 years. It's it's a simple mortgage. The problem is it doesn't get recorded with a, a city entity or a county entity. So the person that is paying that payment on a monthly basis is just a glorified renter. They have no home ownership or any type of rights. Um, and then if the person that draws up the contract just wants to say, okay, I'm going to kick you out, they'll just go ahead and, and go through the, the actual uh, eviction process and get them out. So then that started the process of notes, which I knew already, but then I didn't know private lending. So I was able to be turned on to some people that showed me private lending and how it works. And when we do private lending, it's identical, just like you and I would go get a mortgage from wherever you want to go yeah. to a bank or a credit union. It goes through underwriting, all the credit criteria is reviewed, all the, you know, red flags, CIP, I'm talking jargon. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Know your customer. All those things are done. The only difference is on the back end, we are the bank. We actually fund the note, we carry it, okay. and then we send it off to a servicer that will actually accept the payments and manage the servicing portion for us. Okay. Now, and, and uh, you know, you, you get out of bed every morning to do this. What what motivates you to to get out of bed? Is it money or is it is it helping people or helping community? What is it? Helping communities. It's changing communities because people um, have a mindset that they can't become homeowners and they truly can. Even with interest rates where they're at, owning a home is still more affordable, especially in the neighborhoods we're in because we're able to pass along our savings when it comes to construction off to these home buyers. Okay. So the family that's been renting a house for three generations started way back in the day for like four or five. I think it was four fifty five hundred dollars. They're now up to twenty two hundred dollars, and the house hasn't changed. The house is pretty bad. The house was built nineteen twenty six twenty seven. It's in bad shape. I mean, they literally have some bad things going on in this house, which we don't need to talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyhow, um, yeah, they're going to get into a house. They're going to get down payment assistance through the state of Indiana. There's some other wow. uh, assistance on closing costs. And they have to come with skin in the game because that's how we play this. It's not just show up and zero down. It's you've got to you've got to come with skin in the game. But their monthly payment is, is going to be all in PI uh, and taxes and impounds is going to be less than twelve hundred dollars. Yeah. Wow. What a what a financial relief to that family from twenty two hundred. And you're right. It's just you know we watch this ladder creep. You know, just the, the the amount of money going towards rent just creeps and creeps and creeps. It's amazing. You know, I. Mm -hmm. I see, I see a house behind me. It went for renting the other day. It was thirty five hundred dollars a month. You're like, I mean, that's wow. Crazy. I mean, yeah, just three, four bedroom house. You just, you know, here in St. Louis, and you're just how many of them? Yeah, there's twelve hundred of them out there in the city, just with this one, you know, company that does it. So yeah, no, I, I applaud you for doing that, and that's that's uh, very cool. So you know, I, I what I find fascinating about you, and when I you know got first introduced to you is, you have it up there. I see it. For those who are watching this experience, you may see uh, the wall hanging right behind Ryan, but it's a uh, good things come to those who hustle. And first thing I thought mm -hmm. when I read your bio is this guy is a hustler. I mean, mm -hmm. you wake up every morning, there's no shortage of things to do on your plate. 
I can tell. Um, and But the interesting thing is, you know, you're involved in podcasting, you're involved in coaching, you're involved in uh, being a managing partner of TrueVest. So I, let's take a look at podcasting and coaching. How did your experience in corporate America and your, your 25 years in finance, how did it blossom into desiring to put a podcast together? And, and which is the first podcast you put together, by the way? <laughs> So Chasing Financial Freedom was the very first podcast, but that was rebranded. So it used to be called True Podcast to tie into True Vest. And let's say that was a failure because no one could find it. No one could understand what True Podcast was. So I had to circle back around and understand what I was trying to do. And that's a whole marketing piece. So that was rebranded two years ago to Chasing Financial Freedom. Okay. Um, the hustle piece... I, I I love that sign that's behind me. It, it, it truly is. But the thing that has changed my life is being thankful for the things. And I said this earlier for yeah. what I have today, because it allows me to appreciate it while I'm going after the things that I want. Yeah. We're at it. Like I said earlier, we're at another inflection point that we're going to grow. And I want to be thankful for the business that I have from the cities that we have today. I have more cities knocking down the door than I have the ability to service. And that's beautiful. But the thing that keeps me motivated is what is at my doorstep today. And it's my family. It's it's the things that I have that I cherish because the the things in life don't get us anywhere. It's the experience. And uh, I was talking to another guest on a uh, on one of my podcasts a couple of weeks ago, and he said something that was very just very straight to the point. He says, I've never worked for anybody else. I've been a entrepreneur for 32 years or 33 years. And he said, the one thing I've learned in the last five years as my kids have gotten older is when my kids ask me for, for time, I close my laptop, get off my phone, and I spend that time with them because I can't go backwards with them. So when they're 18, I can't say, I wish you were 12 again because that time is lost. And that's an experience. That's huge for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, experience, you know, we, what we see our society now, uh, just so, you know, embedded in the smartphone visitation, mm -hmm. the time on the smartphone, we have these family gatherings and the absorbing of the moments face to face, watching eye expressions, talking to people is it's just fractured because we have these phones in front of us and yeah, laptops and that time. And, you know, it used to be, you know, 20 years ago before all this, it was, you know, that, that workaholic who just comes constantly, you know, never stopped doing paperwork or whatever at home. And then the cell phone, you know, came into the play and, you know, dad's on the cell phone at 10 at night still. Oh my gosh. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's really an issue. And I think you're, you're right. The experience, you know, people, you know, to get that balance in life, just to experience what is going on and be thankful for what you have. And, you know, you can still put in a full day and find of time course. to squeeze this stuff in and, and I, uh, I, I appreciate that perspective. So, um, you know, you're, you're now, uh, doing two podcasts. What is it that actually motivates you to get to, to get together with guests and to, you know, do, do podcasts? What, what? I love talking to people. I love talking to you. I mean, that's the biggest piece of a podcast is getting a message out. And as I joke about it, I'm just a cog in the wheel. Uh, I want the guests to connect with my audience. I'm just, pushing it along and helping it. And that old adage is if we touch one person and we can change their lives, I was, I'm successful or the guest is successful either, or that's what motivates me. And what I talk about on my podcast, happiness, financial freedom, many people don't actually talk about it. It's not sexy. And I mean, if you look at social media, what I put out there is not sexy. It's just having raw conversations like we're having today about life. And where we're going, and, and I, I'm with you, and, and I digress back into that, is you you said 20 or so years ago, we used to have those experiences and, and so forth. It's funny, when you go out to dinner today, most people at the table will have their cell phones out, and they're down looking down and doing this. And it's you've got people yeah. in front of you to have a conversation, and they're your loved ones, and you don't get that time back. It's it's crazy. I mean, that's one of the, it's one of the things that... Um, is really hurting our communication and our interaction with one another is a cell phone. And, and I'm by all means, I love technology because I use a lot yeah. of it, yeah. but man, when I'm with my family or friends, I, I want to be present and give them my undivided attention. Like I'm here today. 
because this is what I'm here for. I'm trying to share a message. I'm trying to connect with you. I'm trying to connect with your listeners. I want to give it my all. Yeah. And if I'm on my phone, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. So, so very cool. So failures, failures. Okay. Embrace it. Change is a necessary outcome. Embrace it. And, you know, let's experience the, the times we have together. Cause you know, like you said, you can't rewind the clock and, and wish your kids were 12 again. You can't get that time back. And it fleets by so quickly for those of us who are older, I'm 64 and, you know, got children and grandchildren and, you know, yeah, it, it's something that um, we really have to be conscientious about. And I think that, you know, I, I listen, you use the word experience and mm-hmm. I am an experience economy consultant. That's what I am. And what I do on my simple biz 360 is I hone in on the, how we do business over the what, because we are in this experience economy that customers now are mm-hmm. measuring us, engaging us on how they feel about the transaction, how we were treat, treating them, how they were, how, you know, really, there's so much of this how factor. And, you know, business as a microcosm of life, our families are craving, they're also living, our kids are living in that experience world, whether we know it or not. And they want the experience with their parents to be just as rich as a customer wants to be treated well and have a good experience going to the restaurant, you know, um, you know, calling um, the phone company or going into a, a store or whatever it may be. So I think that, um, you know, this whole idea about stopping, absorbing, getting to, you know, putting the phones away and getting this time together, making sure it's special is, is you know, you said it before, being thankful for what you have. That's the truest way in our family settings to thank each other. Mm-hmm. for being family is just to look at them in the eye and spend time with them. And, uh, you know, I think that's the, uh, that's the cool factor here. Um, yeah. So, uh, so now you're, you're two pi, which podcast do you like better doing? I mean, which one chasing <laughs> hap- you know, happiness or, or you're making choice? me choose, you're making me choose between my children. <laughs> I mean, you don't have uh, to, but yeah, no, I, I mean, they, they're different. I mean, yeah. Chasing financial freedom is is truly that it it's it's it is a passion of mine. I would say that's my first passion. Chasing happiness it came later in life because I truly didn't know what made me happy. That's why I had two failed businesses. So if you want to, you know, I, I have a first child chasing financial freedom, second child chasing happiness. They they both have their quirks, they both have their nuances, but I, I love them both the same. And the guests that I get on each of them are very dynamic to where they actually share their life stories too. And, and it's like, uh, we're, we're, we're spot on the message is there and, and we're helping people. And that's, that's where the love comes from is helping the people through messaging, just like what you're doing today. I mean, the messaging piece and helping others is, is a calling and, and people joke about it. The old adage is, you know, you help others. It always comes back to you in spades. It might not be when you want it to, but it comes back. It does. It truly rolls back around and, it's not about me. This, this journey that, um, that I'm on with my businesses is not about me. I want to impact as many neighborhoods as I possibly can, but I want these, these families that move into these homes, these families that come to us for financial coaching. I want them to be empowered to be able to change their futures because they can then pass that along to their kids. They can then pass it along to their kids. And now we've got generations changing because some of these individuals and families have been left behind by the system and they need help. And that's where we come in. And that's the best rewarding part that I get to do is hand the keys over to a family and they get to walk in and I get teary eyed most times. Uh, There's uh, probably hasn't been a time that I didn't get teary eyed, but it's, it's, it's moving to see them. And then they cry and, and the family's emotional and having their kids have their own bedrooms with their own little things that are in there that we kind of do for them uh, is the biggest reward I can get out of the things that we do on a daily basis. Well, it's so cool you say that, and it it aligns perfectly with a young pastor I interviewed not not too long ago, and he said that his dad, uh, the dad's lesson to him was, whatever you do, make sure that you leave things better than you found them. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, you know, that's what you're doing. And, you know, what can we do? What can we do with a simple podcast? You know, if, if there's only one takeaway, hopefully that listener, that viewer is left with just one thing that's better or able to tap into one thing that's better. And we left that person in, in, in a better in better shape because of it. And that's really, yeah, at this point, you know, I, I really pay it forward as my, you know, I'm not saying I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guru of any sort, not saying I'm a thought leader, nothing like that. I'm just saying, hey, I'm being honest, transparent, relatable. Uh, yeah, I've gone through a lot in life, and I, but, I've, but I've also gone through my 30 years of getting ready to write my book with a situational observation lens that I've looked and I've listened and I've dissected and I've learned from the things I hear to my left, to my right, things I encounter in business. And why did I do that? Because I want to be able to share something meaningful with either my family, my grandkids, neighbors, friends, or listeners now. You know, this gives us the opportunity to say, hey, or readers, you know, hey, there's, um, you could go left, but but what if you go right? Here's what could mm-hmm. happen, you know, and it's your it's your decision at, at that point. You know, what do you, what do you want to do? You, and, and I find failing businesses, you know, I've watched these little small companies and I, there's so many solopreneurs, over 20 million solopreneurs in America. And, you know, every year about the same amount go out of business that go into business. And when mm-hmm. you really look at what they're doing, you know what they're doing in many cases, they're missing just a few key elements that, Maybe they just never had exposure to best practices. Maybe they never understood it. And it's not the 30,000 foot view. It's the ground level view. It's, you know, what are you doing? Are you putting your gardening gloves on with your business? And are you tilling the dirt? Are you getting the weeds out right? Are you understand what your customers need, want, deserve? And, you know, what have you ever thought about what they deserve? So I think there's, you know, a great opportunity for us to leave people with some meaningful nuggets. And I I think today, obviously some of your messaging has been very helpful. I would love to ask you this. I know you're, I know you're very humble, um, in in many ways with that, with that, um, outfit of humility on, if you will, in the corporate (laughs) world, what did your 2000 employees, if you could just boil it down to one thing, what did your employees teach you about life? Be consistent with your message. And, and I say that, and, and let's, uh, can we, I'm going to digress just from the beginning because sure. it'll lead back into the thing. When I first got into corporate America at a young age, um, I, I was, <laughs> I wasn't a leader for sure. I, I was a manager and I was not even barking orders. I, I was just telling people what to do. And it finally came to a head. And luckily at the time I had a very good manager uh, and a leader uh, and he closed you know, brought me in his office, closed the door and told me what was going on. And I was in, you know, bare, sad, whatever. And he said, I want you to live by this. Put your brain in gear before your mouth opens. He put it in a next day, came in and put it in a picture frame and put it on my desk. And every single time when an employee would come sit down at my desk, they're like, what is that? That's for me. That's for me to be able to put my brain in gear before my mouth opens, before I say something. And from that point on, it was about a consistent message and that consistent message is always to know your audience and you're not going to always, I mean, there's sometimes you just have to be unfortunately in when you're managing 2000 people, you got to be unfiltered. Right. But the respect piece is I got to know, I don't want to say every single one of them because that was a lot, but I would spend enough time out on my floor in my call centers or my underwriting areas where I knew my employees, I'd walk around in the morning, greet them. Uh, if we were doing some type of food or whatever, I'd be handing out food, having conversations. But it was the consistent message of saying, if you need help or you need some type of direction, we're here. I'm here. My door's open. I literally would be in meetings all day. My door stayed open for people to come in. I would let them interrupt my meeting. I would put the meeting on mute or whatever I needed to do to solve their problems. And that led into so much more to where people craved to work in my department, where they wanted to come work for somebody that actually cared and put the time in because they knew I was going to come in at 530 in the morning and I would leave at six o'clock at night. I was always there to cover most of the shifts other than the graveyard. I had third shift for a while, so I'd have to come in and work with those guys. But the messaging 
and being consistent in that messaging to be open. And then that last piece is that's where I learned change. That was, that was a huge change piece in my life yeah. because my messaging and opening up my mouth before I thought yeah. was a problem. Yeah. So you rebooted the way you approach that. Yeah. So instead of just yeah. blurting out. Yeah. I mean, if, you know, I could remember, I mean, I, I think a lot of marriage counseling, I know, I know, you know, my wife and I, I'm a recovered alcoholic and I went through uh, recovering alcoholics. I went through a lot of issues with my wife in, in the late or mid eighties, you know, so we went to counseling and I'll never forget mm -hmm. the counselor said, you know, it, it, you know, Jeff, from what I'm seeing here, it's not, it's not so much you know, what you're saying, it's your reaction to what your wife's saying. And if you mm -hmm. just slow down and in, same thing, you know, count to 10, yep. whatever, I think that's what she said, or count to seven or whatever it was, but basically the same thing is collect your thought, put your mind in gear before you open your mouth, give it some pause time and make sure that you're, you know, going to say the right words because you can't get them back. And it's the same thing in business. You know, I think, um, you know, sometimes we have to do the same things in business as we do at home. And, you know, we, we, we have to collect our thoughts with our wife. And just like you're saying, you learned that in business with your employees. It was essential to your success. Now, you mentioned, you talk about the difference between leadership and, and management. I heard in a yes. podcast you did. Just for the audience, how would you define both of those? A manager is going to be somebody that is not going to be the individual that's going to put in time. He or she is going to be the person that's going to be managing from the tower instead of being on that ground level, working with his or her employees. Leaders, just that they're showing the strength. They're out there with the troops. Uh, they're doing the work. They're reliable. They listen. They will actually take on responsibility. And the biggest thing is when they make a mistake, they're willing to actually admit it. Yeah. That was that too. in in my change process with managing that many people, man, letting people know that I was, I made a mistake was hard yeah. and that's translated into entrepreneurship, man. It's, yeah. it, it boils down to is I made a mistake. I'll be talking to my construction leader uh, and you know what? Oh man, I, I didn't mean to buy that. You know, I didn't mean to buy these supplies or materials and what can I do? I, yeah. It's it's a cost. I, I have to eat it. But those are things that, you know, we have to, to learn to say, hey, I messed up. Let me fix it and move forward. And I think that's been somewhat diminished and lost oh. in today's in today's I don't know what do you want to call it today's world, whatever the case is, it, it's been lost. I mean, that's where my humbleness comes from is. I am never perfect. I'll never be close to perfect, but I'm willing to try. And if I do fail and if I do mess up, I'll tell you yeah. and I'll let you know. And, and hopefully I have a solution to it. And if I don't have a solution, I got to go find one. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I just did a, a, a full, um, a full day workshop with a company in St. Louis here the other day. And, you know, we went over sincere apologies. You know, we, we were in, we're mm -hmm. in a society and I always say that, you know, in business, we click, we click and drag a lot of what societal stuff is happening and we copy and paste a lot of societal behaviors into business. Mm -hmm. And one of them is this, this, this notion of we blame shift. Let's find another person to shift the fault to. And, you know, we're, we're constantly watching television, media, celebrities, politicians always do this and courtrooms, the whole thing. And, you know, really Dale Carnegie, I mean, just folks, Grab onto this quote, you know, what Ryan's talking about. Dale Carnegie, when you're, he has a quote, when you're wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. So, you mm -hmm. know, not only admit it fast, but be, you know, emphasize it that you, you know, made a mistake and, you know, it's okay to make those mistakes. And the other thing I love what you were, you were talking about in the call centers if any managers are listening to this or any corporate personnel where you have a group of people that are in under your, you know, reporting network, management by walking around, the old Tom Peters, McKenzie, you know, I, I think it's me, management by wandering around, you know, great stuff, right? You know, that, to your point, leadership, that's leadership, getting in there, letting people know, hey, Lucy, hey, John, hey, you know, Ben, hey, Barbara, you know, how is, how's things going? And yeah, we talked about it the other day. I called it the uh, ambassadorship program. What if we just learn 10 things about every employee, every associate? Mm -hmm. If we could learn 10 things about our associate, you know how many times, I mean, I worked, you know, I have a sales agency and I, I, I have now going in my 16th year, 
And I work with a gentleman who traveled with me all the time. And, you know, in three and a half years, he asked me three questions about myself. Three. Wow. Now, a lot of Thanksgivings, a lot of Christmases, ch- grandchildren, all kinds of stuff, you know? And I would ask him how his weekend was. And it got to the point where I started baiting him, you know, just baited him. And, you know, he would go on with these long, windy explanations of what he did, now the grandkids and the son and the da 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 da. And it would just fall flat. He'd never reciprocate and say, so what about you, Jeff? What did you do this weekend? You know, three times. So we're, you know, we, we do for, get this. So love it. Sincere apologies, management by walking around. Very cool. Um, I, I love the fact that you, you know, uh, the consistency. Wow. I mean, how many people even embrace that concept today? You know, I mean, that's just uh, golden. And certainly uh, if you can harness that ability to be consistent with your customers, with your employees, their family. Wow. Um, you know, good consistency, obviously, but, uh, you know, the, the other thing in that too, is the consistency piece, but the last aspect that seems to be missing within the social media world is trust. How do you build trust over social media? Mm -hmm. And that, that I, I have no answer. Mm -hmm. All I know is to be myself and, and put it out there. Um, But if someone has that answer, I'd really like to understand that because I see these um, coaches, I guess, that are out there. Sorry, the price of freedom, if you can hear that, that is the Air Force base flying over me right now. Oh, is that it right there? Yeah. (laughs) Very yeah. cool. Sorry, I'm 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 in the flight pattern, and they're doing their uh, their yeah. daily flight. So I'm I That's apologize. Okay. That's okay. But um, the trust piece is 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 lost, and and it's hard to be able to put that out there. Yeah. And then you see these uh, ads on social media where you have all these coaches that say, "Hey, I, you, I'll charge you twenty five thousand dollars, and I guarantee I'll do this, this, and this." Uh, okay. I mean, and how am I gonna? I'm gonna write you a check for twenty five thousand dollars. I don't even know you. Right. And they expect you to do that. And, and it's, it, it's, it, I, I think it falls on deaf ears at times, but they must be doing something right because they're able to pay for the ads um, and continually do it. But for me, it seems so used car salesman. And I'm not trying to put that, that position down, but that's what it looks like. And that's why I don't advertise any of my coaching just for the simple fact. I don't, I don't want to be called a coach. I joke with myself and I joke with people that, you know, want help. I'm the uncoach. I don't want to coach you for 12 months. I want to coach you for the shortest period of time to get you the best results so you can succeed in life. That that's just my mantra. That's just what I do. So if I only have to coach you or work with you for 30 or 60 days, I'm all for it. I don't want to drag you out. I don't want to put you on some payment plan. I don't want, I want you to succeed. And the quicker I turn you over, the, the more reward I get because it means that we've done something together to change your life and put you on the path where you want to go. Yeah. Yeah. The imposter ship out there is large and, you know, we don't necessarily know who are really imposters and who aren't. Uh, certainly, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's not unfathomable to, to, believe that a 25 year old person could bring, you know, coaching value to your life. I mean, I'm sure, you know, it's the definitely can happen, but you know, it's just, uh, you know, I look at, I look at 365 days in a year and, you know, people who are older have that many more years, that many more days they've lived through life cycles that have proven themselves, you know, proven out what happens if mm-hmm. you do this versus this. And sometimes you don't learn that in the 24th year, you might learn that in the 47th year, you know, and it's, it's just a, it's a hard, you know, it's a hard concept for me. And personally, yeah, I just let it, I don't, you know, I don't strive to be anything on social media. I just put it out there. And if anything, I mm-hmm. use it more for my consulting business. Cause I can, you know, drive a point home in a workshop and, and I do a lot of workshops and those, and those points can be, um, more or less validated and supported by a, you know, podcast. I'm in a three and three business tips in five minutes series right now. So five minutes, people can get a real quick glance at things. And, you know, so, you know, it helps, um, couple, couple last questions. So, um, coaching wise, do you, are, are, do you follow any, you know, programmable format, or did you go through any schooling to be a coach of sorts? Um, 25 years of working in corporate America and, and, uh, starting out door to door collections. It's just, it's a human approach for me. 
Uh, I ask a lot of questions. I want to sit down, have a conversation, figure out, figure out what the individual is looking to do, and then help them through that process. I really don't have any formal coaching. This started when I left corporate America the last time. My old boss um, actually, I apologize. There we go. Uh, Sorry. My old boss would refer uh, broke doctors, attorneys, and airline pilots to me because they wanted to work with the bank that I left. And they needed to get their financial stuff together, I should say. So they would come to me and then that's how that kind of started out. And then I'm like, oh, maybe I can do financial coaching for people that we're going to sell houses to. And it kind of evolved into what we're doing, what I'm doing with change coaching. And and it's just life. I mean, I don't call it life coaching. It's just change coaching. And there's no, there's no rhyme or reason. There's no prescription. It's just, let me talk to you human to human and let's figure out what you're trying to do. And then we go from there and we'll put a plan together. Yeah, but a change is the catalyst. You can't change get, is the catalyst, yeah, right? Yes. You can't get anywhere without this adoption or or embracing mm-hmm. change. Absolutely. So, well, very cool. Um, could you give a shout out again to to where folks can find you again? And we'll put your links in our show notes as well. But if you could just shout it out, if they want to find the podcast, it's True Talk T R U T A L K dot co c o. And if it's real estate stuff, it's Truvest T R U V E S T dot c o. Okay, and we're going to have those uh, listed folks as well. Um, so just uh, two last questions. Um, aside from the piece of advice you got about, you know, put your mind in gear before you open your mouth, what's the, what's the before that, what was the best piece of advice you ever received in life and who gave it to you? Hmm. It would, it would have to be uh, a friend of my father's, and this was when my dad was working in the auto industry, and I'd go to work with him on Saturdays, and I didn't realize how hard um, salespeople and, and people in the, in the car dealerships worked, and I, I'm, I'm 10, yeah, 10, 11, right around there, maybe 12, and I would, I would kind of make fun of the guys that were washing the cars and prepping them for, you know, the sales floor or for to be sold. And so he pulled me aside and said, it doesn't matter who that person is and, and what they're doing or how they're doing it. They're a human being. They have feelings. They have thoughts. And you don't want to talk down to that person or, or look down on them just because they're doing something that you don't want to do doesn't mean it's not worthwhile to them. And that just, that, that sat and rang with me for many years. Yeah. And to this day it is, I mean, like you said, if you're a janitor, you want to be the best janitor you want to be, God bless you. Go do it. If that makes you happy, I'm, I'm happy for you. Yeah. Well, excellent. I appreciate you sharing that. Now, where did you grow up by the way? What part of the country is this taking place in? S- Southern California. So just outside of LA. SoCal and the, uh, what on the, uh, Manhattan beach kind of sector down there? Or no, 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 no. So, uh, there's two valleys in, in Southern California. There's the Inland empire. And then there's the West Valley. I lived in West Covina, Covina. And then we, my dad would, uh, he was managing and owning Upland, um, in Upland, which was about a 45 minute drive from us. Okay. So I'm, I'm more inland. I'd be okay. closer to the mountains. I was about an hour and a half away from the mountains. Gotcha. Very cool. Very cool. Well, well, listen, we certainly, uh, we certainly appreciate you spending time with us today and we end every show. We love doing this. We call it a lost in the shuffle track. And we always ask our guests to, to pick a rock and roll song or a song of inspiration that has played an important role in your life. And it's kind of like one of those songs, you, you know, you know, it's not one of the most famous songs you hear, but you know, do you have anything that jumps out that has been integral in your life that, you know, um, was tucked in there on the fourth song on some album that uh, you just resonated with you. I can't think of, I mean, I listen to a lot of music and I can't think of something that's like resonating with me. Um, what, what was your favorite? I, I, Go ahead. I, I, I have to say this. I listen to a lot of Metallica when I work out and I'm, and I'm trying to get myself into that, you know, hyped up mode. Um, so early Metallica, early eighties is, is really big for me. 
So I, I enjoy that. Okay, so we'll pick a tune. We'll pick a tune from Metallica, early 80s, and we'll put it up there. Uh, so we, we put it up there, folks, as a Lost in a Shuffle track up in a card. You'll see it on the YouTube experience. The, the listeners don't get it on the, uh, on the listening platforms but because we don't actually play the song. But, well, Ryan, it, it's been a real pleasure. I look forward to being on your show uh, later next in 2023. And, uh, you know, just a pleasure. Thanks for reaching out to me, and uh, we wish you all the best. And, and thank you for doing what you're doing for communities and, and people to again leave things better than the way you found them so we really appreciate that and uh, thank you for having thank you for having me on the show it's been an honor and it's been a great conversation all and right. look forward to having you on because we, we could have a, a even longer conversation sounds great I, I look forward to it and folks we as usual will see you in 168 hours thank you very much ryan thank you <laughs>